Great. Um, hi, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, welcome to today's CNCF webinar from Notebook to Kubeflow Pipelines with uh, Mini KF and Kale. Uh, Kale, everybody's favorite green, uh, right? And uh, uh, my name is Ariel Jatib. I'm a business development manager for cloud native technologies at NetApp uh, and also a CNCF ambassador. Uh, I'll be moderating today's uh, webinar, and we'd like to welcome our uh, presenters direct from Greece. They have the Acropolis back there, uh, if you can if you can see. Uh, and we'd like to welcome uh, Vangelis uh, Kukis, uh, CTO and founder of Arito, and Stefano uh, Fioravanzo, uh, software engineer also at Arito. A um, couple of housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not going to be able to talk as an attendee. Uh, there's a Q&A uh, box right at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to drop your questions in there, and uh, we'll get there. Uh, we'll get to them um, as we move along or at the end. Uh, this is uh, also, as a reminder, is an official CNCF webinar, and as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to chat or questions that would be in violation of that code. Uh, basically, just be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Um, please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today at the CNCF webinar page. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Vangelis and Stefano uh, to kick off today's presentation. Thank you very much, Ariel. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Stefano Vangelis to talk to you about uh, Kale and Kubeflow and how you can go from your notebooks where you do your ML uh, work every day to reproducible, immutable Kubeflow pipelines, uh, which you can then uh, have an audit trail of essentially. So uh, let's get started. Let's make sure I can switch slides. What's the problem that Kubeflow tries to solve? Standing up your own ML infrastructure is hard and doing it in production is even harder. And then there's lots of uh, talk and there's a growing need of having your ML infrastructure split across multiple places. So having a hybrid or multi-cloud ML infrastructure. And even if you're running in your laptop and then moving to the cloud, say for training or moving to multiple locations for serving, this is a multi-cloud infrastructure. Your laptop counts as another, uh, one, as one more uh, location for your multi-cloud deployment. So how do you do that? People think, tend to think that, oh, doing ML is about writing code. If I write my code, then everything's gonna be okay. Well, reality is that doing ML requires lots and lots of DevOps, lots of time to uh, stand up the infrastructure, Lots of people, lots of different technologies. You need to uh, configure infrastructure, collect your data, verify your data, manage your resources, cloud resources, extract features, manage your processes, uh, develop your models. This is uh, what most people consider ML. Uh, serve, monitor, and then close the feedback loop and then do it all over again. So Kubeflow is there to help. How? Kubeflow containerizes ML components, so you can run them end-to-end -end on Kubernetes, so you can essentially leverage what Kubernetes does for you, essentially a uniform way you, to run your workloads everywhere. So Kubeflow allows you to experiment with, with state-of-the-art uh, AI technologies end-to-end -end on uh, Kubernetes. It's easy to uh, get on board it, easy to uh, get your notebook up and running and start working. And it also has outstanding community and industry support. So speaking of uh, Kubeflow's community, we're very proud as a Rigto to be part of this vibrant community of more than 30 companies and individuals who contribute uh, patches uh, every day. A sample of these uh, contributions is shown on this slide, which by the way, is from a, a presentation that the PM group of Kubeflow did to the community. In this uh, presentation, we will we'll mostly be focusing on our, Arikto's contributions to Kubeflow, and we'll uh, have this uh, presentation and live demo on Mini Kubeflow, Mini KF. So what is Mini KF? Mini Kubeflow is a packaging of Kubeflow. So it runs 
as an all-in-one deployment, a single node on your laptop or on the cloud, on GCP. So you can, uh, with a single click, have your own Kubeflow, get started very easily. Within 15 minutes, you'll see. And then you can uh, start running your experiments and you can experiment with Kubeflow. And then you can move to a bigger, better, scalable, cluster-based uh, Kubeflow deployment. Mini so mini Kubeflow is the Kubeflow what Minikube is to a scalable Kubernetes deployment. A very easy, all-in-one way to get started. So with this, we'll be having a live demonstration interleaved with the presentation. So what I'm gonna do now is essentially start an instance of mini Kubeflow on GCP and we can uh, let it configure itself and we'll continue with the presentation and be back and uh, connect to it and have our live demo. So let me switch to this desktop, go to the GCP marketplace, explore the marketplace. Look for mini KF. This is mini KF. Launch it in this project. I'm just gonna go with the default options, maybe change the zone so it's a bit closer. And the nice thing you can see is that I can also choose to equip my VM instance with GPUs. So it's very easy to spin up your own Kubeflow with support for GPUs and then you can train much faster on these GPUs. I won't be using GPUs for this demo. So I'll just deploy it. So what happens is GCP will allocate a new instance for my mini Kubeflow. It will deploy it, it will start running our initialization scripts and we'll be able to watch the progress of deploying Kubeflow on this instance by logging into the instance and seeing our mini Kubeflow script uh, progressing. So we see GCP provisioning the instance, firewall settings, a password we'll then use to log into our Kubeflow. So let me copy it. The instance will be up and running in a few seconds. So let's give it a little more time. And if it doesn't come up uh, immediately, I'll switch back to the presentation. So the instance is up. Let me SSH to it. Okay. So let me run the mini KF command and actually see mini Kubeflow being deployed. So at this point, it all happens automatically. All I did was choose some instance parameters, clicked on deploy, this is it. So I'll switch back to the presentation and we'll allow mini Kubeflow to continue deployment. So exactly what is mini Kubeflow? Mini Kubeflow is Kubeflow on GCP or on your desktop or laptop using Vagrant uh, on-prem in just a few minutes, as you just saw. It's an all-in-one single node distribution of Kubeflow. So it's there for you to very easily start experimenting with Kubeflow. It's super easy to spin up your own infrastructure. It combines Minikube as its Kubernetes substrate, Kubeflow, and our Rock data management platform for its storage layer. So what is new in the latest mini Kubeflow that we're now deploying? It's based on Kubeflow 0.7.1. Very soon we'll have Kubeflow 1.0 and we'll produce mini Kubeflow based on Kubeflow 1.0. So we're really looking forward to you trying it out and trying out Kubeflow 1.0 via mini Kubeflow. It supports GPUs as we just saw. It allows you to uh, near instantly restore snapshots of your notebooks and use them with pipelines 
because it works with Rack. More on this later on during our demo. It has quite improved uh, snapshot times for this, and also allows you to uh, snapshot your pipeline steps. And why do mini kubeflow? Why are we interested in mini kubeflow? Because we've seen most data scientists start their experimentation on their own laptop. And there is no easy single quick way to deploy Kubeflow on-prem. Kubeflow is a big project, lots of moving parts, lots of components. It takes quite some expertise to deploy it uh, properly. So we wanted to make Kubeflow deployment that simple, democratize access to its features, its components. We wanted to have data scientists use for their exploration on their laptop exactly the same interfaces that they would then be able to use when scaling their project. So you use Minikubeflow on your laptop, you have the same interfaces, you write the same YAMLs, you uh, provide the same objects to Kubernetes and to Kubeflow, you use the same CRDs, the same resources, and then you take all of these things, move them to another Kubeflow deployment, and you can use the same APIs. Let's have a look at what Minikubeflow is doing. So it's still downloading Docker images, progressing, Nicely, nothing else to do. Let's go back to the presentation. Why is it important to have a local instance of Kubeflow? A single unified user experience, no matter where you are, same Kubernetes APIs and same components. You can start your notebooks. You can spin up your own Kubeflow pipelines. You can have Catib, the Kubeflow component for hyperparameter tuning. You can use Kale, the component we are uh, contributing to Kubeflow, to move from notebooks to pipelines automatically. This is what we'll be demoing today. And it's interesting because uh, Mini Kubeflow has seen quite a lot of adoption in the almost a year that it's been uh, alive in the community. We're now at over 8,000 downloads, and we're really looking forward to having this number uh, go way up after Kubeflow 1.0 comes out. Now, what exactly is the process of doing data science with Kubeflow? ML processes are pipeline processes. There's lots of steps, and each step gets the output of the previous step and provides something to the next step. So we go from ingestion to analysis to transformation. We train our model. We validate our model. We train at scale. Eventually, we roll out and serve our model. We monitor it. And we need to be able to um, have a trail of what we did, right? So we like pipelines because they uh, represent exactly how ML happens, but it's also great if we can start from the end result, a model that works in production, and go back in time and see exactly how we came to have this model. So we can fix biases, fix bugs, uh, train it better, do things like that. So this webinar uh, focuses on two things, on two aspects. One is, what's the easiest way to go from a Jupyter notebook to a Kubeflow pipeline without having to write the pipeline from scratch and without having to deal with the command line at all? And then how can I make the pipeline reproducible? That is, how can I know exactly how each step ran, what its input and its output was, so I can go back in time, explore the step and reproduce my results which is super important for ML, because if you change the tiniest thing, then the result may be uh, way different. So we're going to be talking about two components. One is Kale, our uh, component that we are contributing to uh, Kubeflow, and Rock, our data management layer. How is Mini Kubeflow doing? It's provisioning the Kubernetes cluster, moving right along. So, why go from a notebook to a pipeline? Because people like notebooks. They're nice, they are interactive, they can have their steps as cells in the notebook, they can clearly define their processes and experiment with them inside the notebook, they can run them one by one, find bugs, iterate. Once they're done, would it be possible to just click on a button and have a pipeline, an immutable pipeline? Yes, that's what we're doing. And then, can we actually parallelize some of the parallel steps? Can we do hyperparameter tuning based on a few variables in the notebook? 
this is actually the focus of our workshop we'll be doing at the upcoming KubeCon conference in Amsterdam. So we'd be very happy if you uh, can join us there. Uh, we can have versioning of the data of the notebook that essentially seeds the pipeline. This is also an important aspect of running a reproducible pipeline. I need to know the data I started with. And it's great if I can have this data accessible as just another mounted local file system under slash data. No need to go to an external object storage uh, provider, for example. And then it's great if I can experiment with my notebook in my laptop, but then run the pipeline in another Kubeflow deployment, maybe using GPUs. So what is the workflow we're going to be showing to you today? Before Kale, you'd have to write your ML code somewhere, a Python script, a notebook. You'd have to manually convert it to Docker images, write your own Docker files, assemble your Python scripts in Docker files, try them out. Then you'd have to write code in the domain specific language of Kubeflow pipelines or a similar pipeline component that you may be using. And uh, this is quite complicated work. Then you'd have to compile your uh, Kubeflow pipelines domain specific language into something that would be submittable to Kubeflow in this case, an Argo specification. Upload it to Kubeflow pipelines, run the pipeline. Did things work? Did things not work? Okay, I have to go back, amend my work, start all over again. So this is quite complicated and it has quite a lot of, quite a lot of technical steps, lots of command line, lots of tinkering with Docker files and make files to have the Docker images work. The uh, workload we are making possible with Kale is write your ML code in a Jupyter notebook, tag your cells using the notebook interface. Kale comes with a Jupyter extension that allows you to tag your cells with uh, dependency information, essentially. So you can explain what cells may run in parallel, what cells may uh, will have to run serially, what step depends on what other step. And once you have it uh, ready, and you've experimented with your code in the notebook, click on a button, have Kale compile, convert this into a pipeline, submit the pipeline, link to the run, show you the run happening. You click on a link, you're shown the run, you can do it all over again. So to amend your code, edit the notebook, click on a button, this is it. The edit compile run cycle is edit the notebook, try out my new cells, click on a button, see the pipeline. This is what our demo is gonna be. And mini flow is almost there. So it's provisioning a few resources and let's give it some more time. So what we're describing essentially boils down to continuous integration, continuous delivery for machine learning, starting from notebooks. So we allow the data scientists to develop their models in Jupyter to convert their notebooks to pipelines using Kale automatically, to run their pipelines with Kubeflow pipelines. So start from Jupyter development, experimentation, iteration, create a pipeline, convert to a pipeline with Kale, an immutable pipeline, run it in a way that's reproducible with pipelines, store data on rock, so when something happens or when you need to go back in time or when you need to reproduce your results, explore input and output data of individual steps, again, in notebooks using Rock. So this closes the feedback loop and this is the uh, notebook to pipeline uh, critical user journey that we have contributed to Kubeflow as an ecosystem uh, supported CDJ. Kubeflow is starting. Give it a bit more time. So let's give uh, mini Kubeflow a bit more time to start. We'll uh, spin up a notebook when it has started. Let's continue with uh, Stefan explaining more about Kale. Stefan is the creator of the Kale project. We're very happy to have him working with us in Aricto now. And uh, we'll switch back to mini Kubeflow and uh, continue with okay. the lab demonstration. Let's do that. Uh, so I guess I can can switch here.
so that we have an overview of what KO is. By the way, thank you, Vangelis, for the nice introduction. And since Vangelis uh, mentioned KO several times, let's try to understand what KO actually is. And as a component, it is actually composed of two different things, a, a UI and a backend. The UI is basically a Jupyter Lab extension. Uh, Jupyter Lab supports um, extensions out of the box, and Kale is an official Jupyter Lab extension that provides several um, easy to use UI artifacts that can be used to annotate the notebook very easily, and we'll see later how. And then a Python package that interacts with uh, this um, UI extension to properly parse, package, and then convert the notebook into a pipeline. Again, all of this happens uh, seamlessly and effort effortlessly without the need to use any kind of external SDK, CLI command, no need for uh, additional knowledge about Kubeflow SDKs. It's just about annotating uh, a notebook with um, visual artifacts and components. So I guess that by now we should have Link yes, yeah. up and running. Yes, it it's almost, almost there. there. So Kale is an open source project on GitHub. And okay, we're there. We're done. Just in time. Yep, it's up and running. That's our credentials. We didn't really do anything. Just yeah. wait for a few minutes. So let me get the password. Go to the URL provided. I'll be redirected to Kubeflow's login screen. Let's give it some more time. While we wait, let me uh, chime in with a question that we have uh, from the uh, from Babu, uh, and he uh, and and the question is. Uh, does uh, Kale uh, require Rock to work? Good question. So Kale does not require Rock. Uh, it is uh, essentially a component that can leverage any kind of data management. Um, so the feature that it provides are features that work out of the box. But then in this specific workshop, work, this specific uh, example, uh, we are integrating Kale uh, with Arictos data management pl platform. So some of the features that you will see here are not part of the open source Kale project, but by itself can be integrated with anything else. Great, thank you. Babu, feel free to follow up in Q and A if uh, you have a follow up. Okay, uh, let me know. Okay, we're still. Uh, we have another one. Uh, Camille Rodriguez uh, asks: Is Kale deployed as a Kubeflow component, or uh, does it have to be deployed on the uh, on the side? That's the inter interesting thing. Uh, it is very easy to deploy Kale because. It essentially is just part of a notebook, notebook server image. So what you need, what you just need is a notebook server with um, the, the Kale Python package installed and the JupyterLab extension, and that's it. So it's very portable, easy to use, easy to share, easy to build. So you're saying Kale doesn't really have a server side component. It's exactly, small, it's Python code and it's Python code UI. that lives inside the same doc, um, notebook server image. It works as a server component from the K perspective, but it is not a uh, an additional service to, to your service mesh or cluster. So, uh, mini Kubeflow is up and running. It took some time for the uh, presumably the ingress components to come up. What's our demo going to be? We start a notebook server, install new libraries on the fly. So we prove that the data scientists can essentially work independently without having to 
create new notebook server images, that's just install whatever new Python library they need. Enable Kale, tag your cells, run a pipeline, snapshot your notebook, run a pipeline, and then actually go back and reproduce pipeline state with notebooks and uh, explore what happened. So this is the Cookflow login screen. I've already pasted the password, logging in as a user. This is the Cookflow central dashboard. I can see pipelines. I can see notebook servers. This is a list of my notebooks. I don't have any notebooks running right now. Catib for hyperparameter tuning. The snapshot store, which is rock. Let me also log into rock, same password. No snapshots. So going to notebook servers. And this will answer the previous question exactly. about how we use Kale, creating a new notebook server. Uh, let's name it, I don't know, webinar two, one, whatever. Let's do webinar one. So I'll be using this specific image and this image actually has Kale uh, installed as part of it. And this is all you need to be able to use Kale with your notebooks. You don't need a server side component and you need to deploy something uh, alongside the okay. flow. Okay, so what I'm gonna do as well is I'm gonna add a data volume. I'm gonna call it data. It's gonna be mounted under home slash Jovian slash data. And this is where we'll be storing our data so we can spin up our pipeline. So launching this notebook. Uh, in the back end, this becomes, and by the way, this notebook manager UI is something that we as Arikto have contributed to Kubeflow 0.5, I think it was. Uh, in the back end, we're initializing a pod to host our notebook server. The pod is up and running, and we should be able to connect to it. So what we did is we created a mini Kubeflow instance on GCP. We have spinned up our own notebook server. We have connected to it and we're now ready to use it. And this is great. We didn't have to use any command. It was all seamless, yep. UI, easy. Click, click. Yeah. Go ahead. So first of all, let's um, download um, our example from, we have a, a list of created examples. Would it make sense to increase the font size a bit? Oh, yeah, sure. If and let's also... Do this. Okay. I hope it's enough, otherwise... Just Please tell us. Please speak up, yes. yeah, if it's not visible. So, I will move inside um, our data volume you can see the home Jovian data and start to clone this repository. Okay, Kubeflow Kale is the GitHub organization where, where we keep all the Kale code. Okay. Okay, so now I, I have an examples folder and these are our curated examples to showcase how K works. In this, in this webinar, we are going to use the Titanic um, example. That is an example that we curated and... Okay. I think I can just verify this. Okay, sometimes JupyterLab complains where files are written. In any case, it's a JupyterLab issue. Um, so, as I was saying, we uh, we built this example around a, a Kaggle uh, challenge that offered a dataset composed of data um, of uh, 
Titanic of the shipwreck of the Titanic shipwreck passengers. Uh, so um, the data set is composed of some features related to the specific passengers and then the label, the prediction label is whether they survived or not. We are not going into the specific details of what we are going, of what this notebook does. Uh, it just is some data processing, data validation, visualization, and feature engineering. And then in the end, we have, let me scroll down, we have the machine learning part where a bunch of machine learning models run over this data. They are just simple and dummy models just to, to showcase uh, our workflow, essentially. And then in the end, we collect all the results and, uh, and, and compare them. So I can try to run my notebook and I see that I am missing some dependencies. And this is a very usual workflow. You, you would expect to write code and have to install new library. So let's do that. Let's pip install, install, seaborn. And I'm using the dash dash user flag. And this will become clearer why uh, very, very soon. Okay. Now that I have Seaborn, I can restart my kernel. And everything works. should be up and running. Yep. I can just run some cells. I see that I have the data and everything works. I will go. Uh, through all the notebook because this is not the purpose of the of the example um, but then so we can just um, go on to the second part of the of the tutorial that is enabling kale and uh, annotated the notebook so now I've done the data scientist part I have my notebook with my experimentation my machine learning algorithm that more or less might work or might not, I don't know. And I want to test them in a pipeline. I want to convert, all, uh, I want to convert the notebook to an immutable pipeline. So how do I do that? I switch over here on the left where there is this nice cube flow icon. We click on it with enable kale and a bunch of stuff is shown on the screen. So all these visual colored references, these badges uh, are shown by Kale because it introspects the metadata of the notebook that we had already annotated. So each cell is annotated with a specific pipeline step. For example, here, uh, this code, I want it to become a, a step of the pipeline that is called load data. So uh, clicking on the upper right corner of the cell, I can actually bring up a dialogue that lets me change this metadata. It lets me create new pipeline steps, skip some of the cells because my, I might not care to have them the resulting pipeline. And for example, have um, steps that depend on others. Like here, the data processing step, of course, depends on the load data. And this is true for, for example, here you can see that multiple cells are colored with the uh, same yellow data processing color. This is because multiple cells can become part of the same pipeline step. So K does the work of merging together multiple cells into one single uh, pipeline component. Okay. Um, and, and on the left here, you can see I can choose experiments. Um, that are actually the, the experiments that you have available on, on Kubeflow pipelines. I can have a uh, pipeline name, a description, and several settings. Okay, so once I've done that, 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 that is a very um, easy to do thing, right? You don't need expert knowledge to annotate a notebook or to write a couple of um, settings. Once I do that, Transforming this notebook into a reproducible and immutable pipeline becomes just the, the click of a button. So let's do that. So now that I click compile and run, Kale is asking Rock to take a snapshot of the current notebook server's volume. 
the workspace volume and the data volume. In this way, these volumes are fed into the pipeline steps and your environment um, can be, um, it becomes completely reproducible because every step runs on the same exact environment that you were running your code on. I Previously, I had installed the Seaborn library with the dash dash user flag. This is because I wanted that, um, that Python library to live on my workspace volume that is under user Jovian. So whatever is in there, libraries, um, new, new scripts that you wrote yourself and that you are importing in your notebook, everything lives in that workspace volume and will be present in the pipeline as well. So my pipeline steps will actually have access to the library that I that you installed in the notebook. Exactly. And right. any also and any custom script or additional file as well. So after taking the snapshots, Kale takes the notebook, converts it to a pipeline, and it uploads the pipeline to Kubeflow pipelines. And here it is. Uh, maybe okay, so now we are are using Maybe a, zoom out a bit. Okay. Here, zoom. Okay, so you can see here the pipeline, the load data step that I've shown you before, data processing, several other steps, and all the machine learning models that are actually uh, parallelized because their only dependency was on the previous feature engineering model um, step so that they can run in parallel something that you couldn't do on a single notebook where you would have to run things sequentially and here is the pipeline actually running okay but while it uh, finishes running. Let's talk a bit more about uh, Kale itself. So Kale um, is composed of several independent modules that perform specific actions. So when, when you click that blue button, essentially Kale takes as input the notebook and parses it to the metadata information inside the notebook, creating an internal graph representation of what the pipeline will eventually be. Then as a series of static analysis and um, code introspection um, steps happen uh, in order for Kale to understand what are the data dependencies between uh, the, the steps of the pipeline. Say, if I had um, a variable A defined in the data loading uh, notebook cell, then I would want this variable to be available again in the data processing cell. Just what happens normally in a notebook. Well, Kale takes care for you to detect this dependency and then serialize, save, and deserialize, um, load these variables uh, from step to step in a seamless way. In the end, once, uh, it had, once Kale has this graph representation with all the data dependencies, it is able to generate a self-contained executable Python script that is written using uh, the Kubeflow um, SDK to define the pipeline. And that, that script is the source of truth of the pipeline that is executed to actually upload it and execute it. Okay, so let's go back here. Everything has run. I can go into specific steps. Oh yeah, let's let's change the let's zoom change size the so it's zoom visible. Again. What was it? Okay. Yeah, let's do this. In logs. Uh, okay, this step was not printing anything. Let's see if I can find. I can see things that were printing were printed on my notebook. I will find them in the logs here. And I can can go all the way down to results. And see and see the the resulting um, the, the resulting results huh? of the notebook of the of the models. A so, hundred percent score. Very yes, this is this is, great this is definitely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but trust, this is part of the demonstration, of course. Uh, so, as a data scientist, I will see that this result is strange. Doesn't sound quite right because. 
I can't, it can't be that good that everything is performing excellently. So this is where uh, the data layer, the data management platform comes in because it will allow us to go back in time and surf the reproducible snapshot um, that were taken during the pipeline execution and restore a notebook at a precise point in time to debug what happened. But I'll let first Vangelis walk you through the theory of what we will show you later. So this all comes down to data management. And this is the main reason why we as a Richter got involved uh, in Kubeflow. Our very first goal was to extend Kubeflow so it uses what Kubernetes calls persistent volumes, persistent volume claims in a vendor agnostic way. So we first introduced a spawner for notebooks based on Jupyter Hub that had support for persistent volumes. Then we had a native uh, Kubernetes native notebook manager with support for persistent volumes. We included support for persistent volumes in the pipelines domain specific language. We have a new volumes manager coming with mini Kubeflow and Kubeflow 1.0 uh, next week. So why are we doing all this? This is a page from the TFX paper that we'll have done in 2017. So all of these workflow steps, they're part of TFX libraries and Kubeflow gives you containerized versions of these libraries and it gives you a nice way to run hyperparameter tuning, CATIB, so all of this is Kubeflow. And then you need an integrated front end to manage your jobs and start uh, submitting things. So this is Kubeflow again. This is the notebook manager that we contributed. And then you need a shared framework for job orchestration, which is the, in the case of Kubeflow is Kubernetes because everything runs as a pod. And then you need some way to have pipeline storage. And you can do it uh, with open source tools, you can use any sort of object storage as your provider may be offering. You have to write your pipelines in a specific way to do that, or you can use what Minikubeflow gives you, Rock. So this is what we do. We uh, provide storage for pods, for your pipelines to use. This is the context of our involvement in Kubeflow. And how have we extended Kubeflow? We've made Kubeflow data aware. This means Kubeflow uses PVCs. No matter where you are, at the experimentation stage, you're on your laptop. At the training stage, you're on Google Cloud. At the production stage, you could be in a hundred places where you're actually serving your model and doing inference. So all of these places run Kubernetes plus Kubeflow. Kubernetes integrates with external storage, external storage via an interface called Container Storage Interface, CSI. We have implemented this interface. We sit on, your, on the side of your storage, can take your snapshots, can take your work and seamlessly move it to other locations. So this allows you to eventually run a hybrid cloud, multi-cloud pipeline. So why is it important for running your pipelines? This is your data. This is the data volume that I created initially when first creating the notebook server. This is the data that the validation step of the pipeline, for example, works on. And when the validation step is done, we snapshot this data. We take a snapshot. This is the validated data. And then another step of the pipeline runs on the same data, we take another snapshot. And then another step of the pipeline runs and it fails, or we need to explore it more. So what do we do? We clone the latest snapshot we have into a new volume. We spin up a notebook and we can explore it. That's what we'll be doing later. Or we fix our things, restart the failed step again, and the pipeline continues. So let's do exactly that. Let's choose a snapshot of a step that we believe is suspect for, for a yep. bug or a failure and explore it with a notebook. So let's do that. So let's go. Since I want to debug uh, what happened to the machine learning model, let's take a step of one of the machine learning models. Let's say random forest. So Kale did the work for us to produce uh, this nice markdown artifact that actually points um, to a URI, to a URL that will show us um, the, the snapshot that Rock took at that specific point in time. I could see here um, all the snapshots that were taken uh, during the pipeline execution. So each one of these steps corresponds to a specific pipeline step. So again, I'm going to copy the, the URI of uh, this specific snapshot. And then I am going to create 
a new notebook server from that snapshot. And this can be done from here. I just paste the rock URI, autofill with all the information that, you, that are preserved, and say I'm calling this new notebook debug. Let's roll. So now um, Kubeflow is provisioning a new notebook starting from um, the actual snapshot of the random forest pipeline set. And now, and Kale will know this. And as soon as the notebook uh, server starts, Kale will detect that it is uh, basically uh, restoring a notebook from a snapshot. And it will restore the entire Python context of in, at that specific point in time. So all the variable, all the variables, the Python imports, they will all be there, ready to use. So we're connecting now to an exploration notebook. We want exactly. to explore one of the actual. So I'm not sets. doing anything now. As you, as, you can, as you can see, the notebook loads up, Kale does its thing, and it scrolls down directly to the to the cell that corresponds to the that pipeline step, loading the entire Python context. And actually, I can directly run this cell and okay. Uh, let me let me print uh, so that we can actually see see that is running. See, okay, I have everything running. Um, okay, so if I want to debug, I think I will do it fairly quickly because maybe we are running out of time. So uh, what I'm gonna do is um, analyze. analyze our training data set and after some exploration maybe some hours of cries and desperation i would notice that um, together with my uh, training features i forgot to remove my training label that is the survive label label so all the models learn to map one to one uh, the label that is present in the feature set with the tr with the prediction label so what uh, i need to do is to just remove remove that label yeah drop let's remove that label from the train data set um, in place true and this all right, so now that we have discovered the bug and everything should be running again, I can actually re-enable Kale. Everything is there as it was before with the new addition, not just compiler run, and we'll see later on that the pipeline. Same thing. Has executed correctly. Yeah. So you implemented an edit, compile, and rerun exactly. the pipeline cycle. I just like had to change minutes. the notebook cell, and that's it. I just had to click a button, and the pipeline is there. Great. So let's wrap up while the pipeline is actually running. Without Kale and Rock, you'd have to do lots of manual things. You'd have to be familiar with good control, uh, compose your own YAML files, upload them. Uh, monitor your resources, create your PVCs if you're running on-prem or on your cloud, mount them, fill them up with data, start the pipeline manually, lots of things. Kale just automates all of these things. You're in your notebook, click on a button, snapshot things, compile to pipelines, run, this is it. This is what we call the notebook to pipeline critical user journey, develop, convert to pipeline, run the pipeline, maybe explore the pipeline with Rock. What we want to do in the future is move these pipelines so they're multi-cloud, hybrid cloud aware. Because you, what you want to do is experiment locally around the cloud, right? And that's what we want to, uh, what we want to implement by leveraging uh, vendor agnostic snapshots. And then why not do hyperparameter tuning with Kale and Katib from within your notebook? Why not specify that a few variables are special, they're hyperparameters, specify their ranges, specify hyperparameter tuning algorithm, and have Kale produce the hyperparameter a tuning job. This is what we will be demoing at KubeCon in Amsterdam, uh, end of March. 
uh, we want to track data and metadata with RAC and MLMD, a good flow component. So you can go back in time and have a full lineage, metadata and metadata of all of your artifacts. And finally, mini Kubeflow with Kubeflow 1.0 coming uh, next week. So please contribute to Kale, open source. This is our repository. There's a nice medium article you can read to get started. Please try out all of this, what you just saw. You can deploy your own mini Kubeflow. You can follow our code lab. You can watch the video. We're really looking forward to your feedback. Join the Kubeflow Slack workspace. Join hash mini KF, our channel. We're there to talk to you. Uh, more than, you're more than welcome to provide your feedback. And this is it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I think we have uh, some time for a Q&A session. Yeah, yeah. Thank you all. Of amazing live demo uh, and presentation. I love uh, the abstraction and the value proposition around UX, around all this. Um, I, there's some questions. Some folks were trying to uh, spin this up. Uh, Babu, I'm guessing that best place to go is on the Slack team uh, and ask those questions uh, that they're having. Uh, and two kind of patterns that I see in the questions are around workflow and security. Uh, so let's handle the, the, the workflow a little bit. And then Derek Wyatt, I think, asked a good one, which is, what is the expected workflow between the data scientists and the operations personnel? Uh, Ergo, uh, the data scientist uses Kale to create the pipeline, but then what pipeline becomes blessed by ops is now uh, under their responsibility. How are ops and data scientists expected to interact? Uh, Git uh, command line, Git, a notebook? This is a good question. So Kale itself does not have uh, any interference with this process. The process of th this does become a pipeline that's upload it to KFP, it becomes part of KFP's database. If you have a, a blessing process, or if you need to move this pipeline somewhere else, you can continue doing this exactly the way you do now. And the pipeline itself actually has input parameters that come from the notebook. You see that one of the notebook cells is marked as a parameters cell, and that's where we get the pipeline parameters. So uh, you don't need K to actually run the pipeline once it's been uploaded. You can rerun it over and over again with different parameters. The operations is detached from what the data scientist does. But if you need to actually modify the pipeline, so you need to involve the data scientist, you need to spin up your notebook, edit your notebook, click on the kill button again, and then you get a new version of the uploaded pipeline. Does this answer your question? Uh, I'll leave it. I, I, I think it gets a, 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 I think once it's a pipeline, right, CICD ops kind of responsible, that's the, the handoff. And I think with the platform, to me, it looks like it does, or the, the solution is it kind of makes it easier for the data scientists to work a little bit more in an environment that feels native uh, to their experience and by way of the notebooks. Exactly. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there to ask. And then about the security questions. Uh, so I, I think there's, uh, uh, somebody asked broadly, uh, security, Juan Beltran. Uh, and then uh, there was also about the images uh, which I'll, I'll roll into that. Oh, Derek Wyatt is also on, on our back, but let's, uh, I, I guess let's, uh, the, the easy ones. Um, the images, where are the images that are getting pulled? I guess with GCP, those are the, the vetted AMI type things over there. Uh, I'll leave it to the person who asked the question about uh, the images to clarify, but can you speak, uh, I guess, a little bit on security and broadly? Yes, so the images, there is a Minikubeflow instance image that we have uploaded as a public image on GCP. So Minikubeflow can become a part of the GCP marketplace. And then this image will download all of the, will pre-fetch essentially all of the Kubeflow related images that then KFCATL, the Kubeflow deployment tool uh, installs. So all of these are uh, public images and that's, that's why you can uh, deploy them on your uh, Minikubeflow instance. Uh, about security, uh, you'll see that uh, our notebooks, it wasn't apparent in this demo, but we have, we've had other demos in the past. Uh, we, we have been contributed heavily to uh, Kubeflow uh, multi-user support. So all of these things run in your own namespace. Notebooks are managed as part of your own individual namespace. Uh, Kale uh, works inside this namespace as part of your notebook. We are working on making 
pipelines multi-user enabled. So right now in mini kubeflow pipelines, all pipelines run within a single kubeflow namespace, but we are working and we have a design that we're implementing and it's part of the community and it's open for discussion that allows you to run your own pipelines within your known namespace. So security wise, whatever you do uh, has to do with objects that live inside a single namespace and they can only interact with objects within your namespace. Uh, same thing with persistent volumes. All of these persistent volumes belong in your own namespace. And when you access ROC, you use ROC specific tokens that again link your namespace with a ROC namespace, a ROC account. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. We can actually run a couple minutes over. I checked with Taylor. She's good. Uh, so if, if you can hang around, I, I, I'll ask uh, uh, I'll for a couple more of these. Uh, let's go with Frank S. who's asking about roadmap. Uh, for multi-clouds, I'm interested in the hybrid cloud multi, uh, uh, kind of roadmap. Uh, and he, he says, I think the abstraction of Kubeflow ops instead of KL interface for data scientists. Yeah, and yeah, that would, that would uh, I think that would, was something we just covered. Uh, but can you speak a little bit to roadmap, I guess? When can we expect some of this support for multi-cloud and, and uh, uh, yes. hybrid cloud? So uh, Kubeflow 1.0 uh, coming out next week, mini Kubeflow with Kubeflow 1.0 coming out next week. Then we are working hard to A, implement multi-user pipelines for Kubeflow. And uh, this will be part of open source Kubeflow. We have a design that uh, anyone can contribute to, which is now under discussion in the community. Then we're working to bring hyperparameter tuning into KL. This is part of our roadmap. And then, uh, multi-cloud, hybrid cloud functionality, this depends on whatever storage you're using, underlying your pipelines. So this is more of a rock question. Uh, we are uh, testing with clients uh, rock in multiple locations and the rock registry, a component we use to synchronize multiple locations. So how to implement multi-user, multi-cloud pipelines depends on either writing your pipelines in a way that accesses some sort of external storage explicitly. So it then becomes your responsibility to keep this storage synchronized and available across locations. Or if you're using ROC, uh, you can uh, seamlessly essentially uh, specify that certain data is to be shared across administrative domains. So whenever you place a snapshot from one pipeline step in a specific bucket, this becomes available in another location which then allows you to spin up the second half of a pipeline with input this snapshot. We essentially use snapshots to move the output of one step in location A to become the input of another step in location B. But this happens uh, under Kubeflow at the storage management, the data management layer. Okay, cool. We should, we should talk about that a little bit more uh, later. Um, greetings from Amsterdam. Looking forward to meet you at KubeCon. How does KO metadata change look, uh, changes look in version control? For example, which tools uh, review NB? Like uh, re review tools, I guess like a diff for, uh, for this, if I'm understanding. The so the, the metadata is actually part of the notebook itself, right? And the notebook itself is a JSON file. So whenever you change the metadata, uh, these uh, this change trade is actually very easy to see because, because it becomes just a diff between two different JSON files. Whenever you change um, a, a key value of the metadata of the notebook, that is what Kale does to store this information, uh, it's just like comparing two dictionaries. Okay, cool. Uh, and uh, with that, I think we've uh, run over uh, enough. Uh, there's a couple of questions. I'll point folks like uh, Josh uh, about uh, who, who asked about how to improve the solution testing, develop, suggest tutorials or anything. Um, I, I imagine uh, the, the Slack channel is the best place to kind of go and interact with you and the community. And, and kind of follow up on, on all this There's great stuff. There's also a Kale channel on the Kubeflow Slack, so you can also mm, place questions there. We are monitoring There's the channel. two channels. There's, There's mini KS Kubeflow. and the Kale channel as well. So you can find us there. Well, awesome. Well, great. Thank you very much, uh, Vangelis and Stefano, uh, for the great presentation. Um, and that is the end of the questions of the time we have for today. 
Thank you all for joining us. This webinar a recording in the slides will be available later today. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at future uh, CNCF webinar. Have a great day or evening, uh, wherever you are. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye.